Well, hello. Thank everybody for being here today. Um, I want to talk to all of you professionals. And I want to, this is not a normal rah-rah speech about, you know, being creative with your lives or anything. There's, there's a lot of evidence, empirically proven, that show the health benefits of finding some kind of creative avenue or venture. Um, what happens when you participate in something artistic, and that could be poetry writing, it could be archery, it could be anything, be martial arts, um, that the chemicals that are produced from the positive emotions of said activities actually lower the chemicals, lower other chemicals in your bodies that trigger diabetes, strokes, heart disease, depression, cancer. There's even evidence of uh, cancer remission in some from taking a painting class. So there's, the evidence is out there. I don't want to pretend that I'm a doctor and talk about all that stuff too, but it, there's a ton of it available. Um, and so with your professional lives and everything, I, know, I realize there's not a lot of time. Some of us find it, you know, you have young kids. Um, I have two daughters that are now grown through college and everything, but, so I know the trip. I also know the trip of being young and being uh, a starting professional and how much, many hours it takes to do that. And so um, I wrote this book called Faces Are Three, of virtuosity, which is how to find, find and develop your inner creative genius. And it's based on a conceptual thing that is, that is mine, on a three-pronged approach. And I'll, I'll explain more in detail as it goes, but it's clearly described in the book. And um, it's if you decide to do something creative, there's a way that you can succeed at it more quickly, which means less time, okay, which means money which means more time for your family, it's more time for your business or whatever. And it's an idea that's based on sort of a recycling thing where the three corners are in touch with each other. So I will get into that. And, and Jerry has experienced this for seven years uh, as one of my martial arts clients, but I will get to that in a little bit. At any rate, life begins when you want it to. And for me, uh, for you, it should be now, okay? Uh, you can have a second genesis third, fourth, fifth, as long as you want. Um, I got my first tattoo at 40, okay? So I waited 22 years. When I was 18, I'm going, okay, I can get it, because mom and dad were not going to allow me to do that. And uh, I waited until I was 40, and I've had several since then. And it's, that's kind of a metaphor for everything. Um, but it's, it's funny, because I hid it from my mother uh, for two years. And I, didn't, I couldn't tell her. It's just a tattoo, big deal. Nowadays, everybody goes, what's the, what's, the big, what's the big deal? And, but my mom was educated, you know, hard, you know, and, and uh, she comes up to me one day, and she says, I know about your tattoo. And I said, really? She said, yeah, your younger brother, Eddie, ratted you out. And I go, really? And she says, yeah, you always used to wear cut off short sleeve shirts and everything, and you've been wearing nothing but long sleeve shirts for two years now, what do you think? And was, you know, mom was a chemist and really bright lady. So anyway, uh, but the point of that is, is I decided to finally do something, okay, it's, as, as insignificant maybe as a tattoo, but it was very significant to me. Also, went along with the rock and roll career, but we'll get to that. Anyway, uh, I'm college educated. I was gonna be a, a physical therapist. Um, I was a college basketball player, and my junior year of college, uh, I felt this compelling, compelling, compelling urge to turn pro as a guitarist. You know, I'm studying, I'm, I was going to go, uh, I went to a very, very good school in southwestern Virginia, and uh, wanted to go to grad school. I had an inn at Duke, I was all set up to do the thing. And, my junior and senior year, I just started playing guitar. I mean, I, I had played all through high school and stuff too, been in a lot of bands, but uh, I, was gonna, I decided to turn pro. And everybody thought I was out of my mind, understandably, but I felt this very, very heavy creative urge to do that. Now, I'm not recommending that now. Music business has changed quite a bit. I've had a great career, still am, but you guys are here, so this is what you do. But at any rate, this concept of three, I started back when I was a junior in college. And the, the idea 
is to ha is if you break things down into three, and again, I'm, I'm going to get into this just a little bit. I, I'm here really to, to get you all to start thinking about starting some kind of venture. But my three starting out, because I was going to have to compete with pros. And when you do that, whether it's athletic or music or, or law or whatever, it's, everything's the same thing. Business is tough and you have to compete. What I decided to do was I was going to focus on three aspects of playing the guitar, technical prowess. And I wanted to be technically better than anybody. <clears throat> so one of my points was technical prowess, OK? Um, another avenue that was compositional ability. I wanted to think about, OK, I need to write. Because if you're truly going to make it anywhere, you have to be original. And then <clears throat> I wanted to develop, as a third point, my individuality uh, and, and the, the creativity on that side. In other words, I wanted to have a certain look. I wanted to have a certain dynamic on stage. I wanted to have, you know, while I had this technical ability, while I was playing songs that I had written that were hopefully as good as anything out there. And I would bang off of these three as I would practice. Sometimes I would actually stand in front of a mirror, still look what I look like. OK, I know it sounds uh, terribly narcissistic, but it's true. You need to do this. You need to look at yourself. Um, and I would just roll between the three points, work on my technique, work on my composition when I felt like it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't just demand it. Another thing, too, if any of you are involved in anything creative at the, at the moment, if you hit a wall, I have a, a saying that go through the wall but for five minutes. That's it. If you hit a wall, and then, you, like I'm, I'm writing now, I've written, this is my seventh book. If I hit a wall writing, I'll continue for five minutes. That's it. Five minutes. And then I go, OK. And, and, and if you're going to continue, you will, you'll know by then. If not, get away from it. Get on something else. Go to another point of your triangle or leave it. Do something else. At any rate, and then these three things, and I'm going to make a reference to Jerry later on, as uh, alluded to earlier, with martial arts study and stuff too, because you have offset threes. Just because you have these, uh, these three points, they're not the only three points in any discipline. You have many. But it's a focus. And so an offset three might be if I took my technical prowess, let's say, which is one of the original three. And so the, then that becomes the middle, the, the main focus of the new triangle, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay, the original triangle being pro guitar player. All right. So my first offset three off of my technical ability was concert performance, recording in the studio, and seminars. I, I gave hundreds of seminars across the country as a guitarist. And so I would focus on those areas as my technical offset three. Um, and, and this can go on and on and on and on and on. I want to keep it simple because we don't have much time today. And again, you're only going to retain so much. Again, it's in the book. It's clearly written in the book. But anyway, um, I, I, I mentioned earlier, engaging in any creative process is healing. OK, look it up. You'll be blown away by the data that's out there that shows that, you, that it's healthy to do this. And when you get to a certain age, you get in your 40s and 50s and stuff, people around you start dropping. OK, I lost a brother to cancer. I lost my father to cancer. My brother was a world-class and well-known opera singer. Um, and so finding some kind of an avenue, when you don't think you have it, I mean, even if it's five, 10 minutes a day, um, do it. Do something. And, and again, we, we will, I'll, I'll be specific about that. Um, Passion is youth, youth is passion. Nostalgia is a great triggering mechanism, OK? Past loves, you know, athletic endeavors. Uh, you might have headed the, the debate team in high school and killed it in one debate or something. You remember these events and everything, too. They can be very, very motivating for a absolutely uh, finding your, your, a creative outlet, something that you had maybe not previously thought about. I'm going to talk about writing poetry. I'm going to talk about writing a novel. I've done it all. OK, but at the same time, you know, the catalysts that you had as, as a youth are very, very important. Um, the music that, when in adolescence, that you listen to sticks with you for life. I can promise you that. OK, and it's an amazing, amazing motivator for whatever you do. 
But it's interesting, uh, and I, I I'll, will date myself completely here, but I remember hearing All Right Now by Free the first time it came out, and I'm in my Corvair, so I'm dating myself like crazy, right? And I'll never forget that moment, ever. And it, boom. And so I'm a pro rock guitar player. But anyway, um, first poem, short stories, playing an instrument, athletics, as I mentioned, anything that you did earlier in life, look back and, and, and think about it. Think about what really, really, really made you smile. Because life just beats us down all the time. Our kids are, uh, and, and in a good way, it's just, you know, uh, health insurance premiums, you know? You know? We just, everybody's going, whoa, really? Um, and so um, I will return to this as, again too, but there, your, your avenues may not be apparent to you right now. You know, you, remember, you may not think that you can write a book of poetry and have it published, or write a novel. Um, the first novel that I wrote, I, uh, I'm going to skip ahead and come back. Um, I, I, I built my three. Okay, so I, want, I read a lot. Now, I don't know if any of you are, are fans of novels or whatever, but for me, it's always been a passion, even since I was very, very little. And um, I read and read and read, and I thought, man, it would be really cool to write. And I remember meeting Pat Conroy, the famous author, recently died, that wrote The Prince of Tides, which is my number one favorite novel ever. But uh, plenty, there's a lot of great writers out there. But I remember talking with him years ago. And uh, he just looked at me and said, you're a guitar player, aren't you? And I said, yeah. So it's like, it was kind of weird. But um, you know, I asked him, I said, uh, he, if any of you are familiar with him, fine. If not, trust me, Southern writer, that you can tell that he lived, his, his heart and soul was in each thing that he, he, he wrote. And he wasn't like these, the novels of today that have 30 novels that and they have other writers that are doing them for him and everything. He wrote his own stuff based on life experience. Very Southern, very Gothic, very dramatic. But, and I feel the same way. I'm Southern and dramatic and sometimes gothic that way. But um, he said it took a, a piece of his soul every time he finished a book, and, and that, that stuck with me. When I decided to write my first novel, I started 10 years ago. And I never had a sister, so I wanted to develop a sister character. Okay? I wanted, I wanted a, a woman that would be a champion. Okay? And uh, this book is called the, the Girls of Yesterday, and it's not about, when it came out with it, all these rock people came out to go, that's all about the girls and the, you know, the tours and everything. No, no, no. It's about women, the power of women's intuition and strength. And, and so I developed a relationship with this sister, and the character's name is Loretta. And that was one of my points, the main focus. A lot of characters, but the main focus was her. And in the relationship with, it was written in, a, in the uh, first person. So um, I got to feel that and imagine that. Uh, the second point of the triangle was college basketball. It was, that was the backdrop. And like I, I said earlier, I, I was a college basketball player. And a lot of memories from that. So I was, I was kind of lining up, you know, okay, there's going to be this dealing with, you know, the sister and brother. This guy goes to school with his college basketball experience. And the third thing was life experience, your, your, your traumas, your, your, your triumphs and everything. I mentioned earlier, I, lo I lost a brother that was one year younger than me to cancer. That took me out. Worst thing I've ever been through. The only thing I can imagine worse is kids. And uh, we all are connected some way, somehow, with the, the, the tragedy of that. But my brother and I lost my father exactly 20 years before. And so in the book, it's tragic, it's southern, it's gothic. Uh, she's a heroine, but the the emotions and the angst and all the reality that I had experienced with real life uh, events helped me shape how I depicted her in this thing. And it was tough. And I thought about P Pat Connery when I finished it, because when I wrote the epilogue in that, it, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was in tears. I mean, I was just thinking, man, this is just rough. And, and so you're reliving these emotions, but they're good. They're good for you. They, they're cleansing. And when life, you know, life gets in the way with all of us every day, um, it's important. It's not hard to do, to the point. And this book was released 
uh, like I said, I started it 10 years ago. So it was released, I don't know, eight years ago. All these people came up to me and go, man, I can't believe you wrote a novel. I, I'm well known in rock circles, okay. I can't believe you wrote a novel. Wow, why didn't you find the time to do that? Well, it takes a lot of time to write a novel, okay? But I would take an hour on a Friday afternoon and I would write a page or two. That's it. Most great writers will tell you if they get three or four pages a day, you're doing really well. So don't look at it like it's a 300 page thing because you'll, you'll never finish. Jerry here is getting ready to have a black belt test in October, and he's been with me for seven years, and it's been a, a long ride, but if you think about everything you've done from then since now, that's a whole lot of ground we've covered. A ton of ground. But you can't look at it the way. I've, I, I'm on hundreds of recordings. You can YouTube it, you know. Um, it, it, they're all out there. And if I thought, when I turned pro at the age of 21, that I, would, I had all that daunting work in front of me, I, I would have gone, whoa, you know. But you do it. And back to the writing, I, w I, I, told, I, I would just say, it's simple answers, just, I would just write a little at a time. I mean, that's it. You know, we've all heard that, you know, what, you take the first step and you take the second step and yada, yada, yada. Um, that's all nice. Um, doing it is an actual thing. You know, it, it, and the reality of actually finishing something is the reality of finishing something, okay? And so if you can deal with a mid and long-term goal, uh, because that's the mindset you need. We are such a quick fix society today, I can't imagine young kids getting anything done. You know, the attention spans nothing. Uh, you, we, we, this record that I want you all to have, uh, it's got four songs on it. You know, we used to do records with 12, 16 songs all the time. Well, nobody listens to it. Nobody buys records anymore. And I'm calling them records, so here we go again. Anyway. But anyway, so, but back to, uh, I, 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 there's a couple of case studies. There's, there's three, to be exact, in this book. And I use them for different reasons and stuff. Uh, Jerry's a, a case study that's not in this book, but I, I'm going to example him today, with your permission, of course, brother. All right. Um, but uh, Ethan is one, and Ethan is a, a uh, uh, government security specialist and top-notch engineer. He's married, second time, okay. He's got kids, previous to now, works, works his behind off. Uh, works, works, works. He's been studying guitar with me for, for nine years now. Came into, I was doing, for a while I was doing a bunch of jazz stuff. And I was in the professional ranks as a jazz guitar player. I, I write about it in the book because there's a huge disdain from the jazz community to the rock community. It's a big snob thing, classical community, same thing. Everybody's got their own biases and whatever. And it's just, hello, it's like welcome to the human race, right? And it happens in art, believe me, big time. But I had succeeded on an international level as a jazz player too because I love the music. A rocker at heart, but I, I did this for a while. I needed a break from the madness of the rock and roll circuit, and and you know, and I had been divorced and everything. And rock and roll certainly did not contribute to a really, really healthy marriage and stuff. But my my former wife and I, uh, mother of my kids, we're fine, and she understands, and it's tough. But getting back to Ethan. Um, they come into this club, this jazz club I'm playing, and he, they're really paying attention, he and his, his girlfriend at the time, now wife, and uh, paying real close attention. So I, I, I went and was talking to them at, on break, and uh, he goes, man, I want to study with you. And I go, you're into jazz? He says, yeah. And, I, and, I, and he was studying with a guy at the time, but he says, you, there's something different about you. So nine years later, he found the time to take an hour a week come take a guitar lesson. Nine years later, he's still there. We're doing a lot of rock and roll stuff. We're doing a lot of country stuff. We do blues. We do all kinds of stuff. And I'm, I'm very much the way I teach, and, and, and again, I'll reference Jerry, can attest to this. You all are individuals. So if anybody was ever training with me in any capacity, whether it's martial arts or whether it's studying the guitar or learning how to write, if you want to write a novel, um, you're an individual, and so the focus is on your inner creative genius. That's what this is about. This is about everybody has their own creative genius. God gave it to us. Uh, whether you do something with it or not is up to you, but it's in there, trust me. Um, 
a year into his guitar study, he goes, tell me about this martial arts school that you have. And I said, well, I teach Krav Maga, it's an Israeli art, and I've been, I've been do, I'm involved in it 15 years now. And uh, I said, well, it's pretty cool. It's real direct and it's, it's all about sur street survival. It's not about this and that and fancy this and that. And I've done a lot of different kinds of martial arts, but you might like it. And of course, when he's, you know, after his lesson, he's in my, my condo in the little room, then I show him a move or something. He goes, oh, this is really cool. Anyway, so eight years later, he's training with me, okay? So he's in it, in it for two, two things. He found his inner creative genius, okay? And he's still doing it to this day. And he is busy. He's busy, 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 just like we all are. But he finds the time for an hour a week for a guitar lesson and a couple hours to train. That's what he does, okay? Those hours can be you writing your own stuff. I want to talk about the writing and, you know, and getting in that, especially the poetry. Um, but at any rate, um, and, and, and back to my first novel too, the, th the events that shape your lives, you know, they stick with you. I witnessed a murder-suicide when I was 14. Happened about from me to you. Maybe closer. Maybe closer. 14, I see it. And it was at a football game. And it was, it was just weird, but it was right there, and I saw it, and, uh, and I wrote about it in the book. I used those, that, that, that imagery because I lived it and breathed it. And then I, I got real creative with it and everything. And I brought my sister into it, you know, my Loretta, my imaginary sister. And it was really cathartic for me to do this many, many, many years later. Now, uh, there was no psychological damage on me. I mean, life happens, and I ha I, I, I've had some great inner mechanism since I was very, very young that, you know, I see violence and, okay, it happens, and I'm not condoning it, I'm just saying that it happens and it shouldn't just shake up your world. I talked to both of my daughters about rape a lot growing up. I said, okay, there are great, a lot of great men in the world, okay, but let's be safe, let's do this, let's do this, and God forbid, but, you know, Let's, let's, my, my analogy is the same though. It's that I want you to be aware, smart, okay? And we'll deal with it when we do, okay? If we do. And so, uh, and that shaped me obviously. Uh, uh, the, I, I wanted to write poetry. And keep in mind, and let me say this too. My major in college was kinesiology, okay? To be a physical therapist, okay? And my minor was psychology. Um, all the, the requisite, you know, path to a physical therapist. And uh, the, I took one English class in college that was required, core, core curriculum. Took a literature class too, because I wanted to, and that was it. So I, I didn't train to be a writer. Everybody thinks I went to music school and everything. No, I've taught at Berkeley and Boston. I've taught at Duquesne and Pittsburgh, you know, and a couple of other really fine institutions and stuff too. But that's just as a guest rock guy star coming in and doing the thing. But I could speak and I could relate to college kids and given the reality of the music business and whatever. I didn't have any training in writing. I just started writing poetry. I mean, when I was younger, I, I, t I said earlier, I wrote, Novels, I mean, read novels. And uh, I didn't read any poetry other than English class requirements, you know, and, and going this and we're going, I didn't understand the, the genius of Dylan Thomas, you know, when I was a kid. Now I do, okay? And so I wasn't trained in college to do this. I didn't go to music school. I didn't do any of that stuff. Everybody thought I was nuts again, you know, uh, practicing guitar like crazy my last two years of college to turn pro. Yeah, here I am. Poetry, who, everybody write a love poem to their, a significant person when you were in grade school? I started really young, by the way, okay. Actually, earlier than grade school, if you can believe that, but did, any, did everybody write something to somebody, even if it's, I'm sure you did. Sure you did, no, no, never? Sure. Most of us did, okay. How cool was that, though? And look at, look at the time and effort you put into it, you know? Jane, your eyes are so blue. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Boo-hoo-hoo. All right. 
Um, we did that. And I mentioned earlier as well about nostalgia being such a wonderful trigger to get up off your behinds and do something. And so the three points. I, the first poetry book I wrote was called um, Reflections of Darkness and Light. Okay, I'm a very emotional guy. He knows well. Okay, um, and the, the first point was the theme, was darkness and light. Okay, events that were dark, tragic, events that were light, uplifting. And I wrote in the preface of the book that every time I finished a poem in that book, there are 51 exactly, and that's, that, that number is for a reason. They're all one page, so not like the meandering eight-page poet poems and stuff, too, which could be short stories. But at any rate, I, uh, I, I took events. I, you know, uh, I, I thought about you know, the, the many things that happen in life. But the second point, and that was the first point, the second point was stylistic slash conceptual. Do you want to write something that rhymes? Do you want to write something that is acrostic? And if you, know, uh, you don't understand what acrostic means, that's the first letter of every line. There's a representation of either the line in, in a row, something that reads down this way, or it, it, it mean, it's, look it up, OK. But acrostic is a very cool way to write poetry, OK? Um, and, 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 other, and, and more prose-like poetry, where it's not rhyming, where it's just flowing, where it's just your thoughts that have some kind of a conceptual, philosophical you know, bearing and, and avenue. So I would, I would go, and back to philosophical too, I mean, there could be things that you feel, your emotional things like compassion or, um, for me, uh, having this young friend, m mentally challenged friend that, that I grew up with all through life, just watching him grow up and just succeed, it just blew my mind and I wrote about it. Um, uh, belief in God or whatever, whatever your philosophical things are. But I would go, one day I would go, okay, I'm gonna do something dark, okay? And I'm divorced and down the, the wall, of my, one of my walls in my house, are all the pictures of my kids and everything, my two daughters growing up. And so that was a, that I, I thought about, wow, I'm just looking back and how cool would it have been if marriage would have worked out and we all would have been a nice, whole, healthy family and everything, which is a tough way to go, but I, God bless all of you that get that, okay? And uh, rock and roll after many marriages and everything, I'll, I'll get there someday, but anyway, um, just kidding. Um, I do believe in that. And so I'm, I'm thinking about my daughters and looking at them at different points of their lives, and I thought, okay, this is a dad's soliloquy. And that was my poem. And I took an hour or two on that Friday afternoon and wrote about that. And like I said, sometimes you have tears of joy, tears of sadness, but it's really cathartic. And I'm telling you, you feel better. Everybody's been really emotional. You get a good cry out or you get, get something or something uplifting and everything, and it's good. And by the way, the stress relief is amazing because you can have stress in success and in failure. And, and you need to fail to succeed, and you need to succeed to fail. Do you all understand that? Hopefully everybody knows that. I mean, the understanding of you need to fail to succeed is a little bit easier, but you need to succeed to fail. You have to be good at something and then get shot down and fail and go, well, wait a minute, I thought I was pretty good. Then you fail and then you go, okay, and then you succeed again. So it's, it, it's, it's a back and forth, it's, a, it's kind of a dichotomy, but it's not. But at any rate, and then I'd write a light, something light, something uplifting. Uh, my daughters, I I'd write about them uh, at the beach, spending all afternoon with this handicapped little boy, just hanging with them. I didn't say to do anything, and I was a single father, I'm taking my daughters and their and their cousins to the beach, all girls, the only guy, you know, all these little girls running around, and they're all playing with this, this, this boy for actually two days. It blew me away, and I wrote about it, and it was a great poem. And so, one at a time, you don't need to, don't think of the whole, the end result. It, it will blow you away. It will stop you from starting. You know, uh, if my, my brother here, Jerry, had thought about all the work that we'd look at seven years ago to get to this point now, 
you might go, whoa, I don't know about that, you know. So you, you understand what I'm saying, you know, those of you that, that have college degrees, you know, you go, well, it's four years, and then, then graduate degrees and whatever. It takes a lot of work and effort. It takes a lot of effort to raise the child, you know. It takes a lot of effort to be in a relationship with someone, okay? But you do it. And if you think about, you know, all the work beforehand, well, you're going to bail. That's just the way it is, you know. Um, so at any rate, all of a sudden I have 51 poems done. I wrote one about a pine tree. That was outside of my, my, my studio. I mean, it could be anything. You just, you know, and again, not all of us are poets, but I bet more of you are than you think. Not all of us are novelists. Maybe you can write a short story. Just get your thoughts down. I'm sure someone has started some story at some point. You might have done that in high school or college, you know, when you wrote a paper. Um, at any rate, um, it's in there, and look for it. Um, again, the idea of three, se separating things into three. Um, I've been training Jerry for seven years. And in my conceptual approach to what I teach, there's, there's a baseline that I use, or a single point of the triangle. You can, it could be the bottom rung, got a rung here and you got a rung here, but there's points and everything, but, and it's Krav Maga. Okay, and I don't want it, it's Israeli, who cares? It's, it's, it's a great system, but whatever. But I also bring in on another point, Filipino art, and another point I bring in the Japanese art. As said, I, I've, I've trained for decades in this stuff. A lot of other styles as well. And what we do is we bounce off of because the three styles complement each other greatly. And, and listen, I could insert another style. I could take one of them away and put another one in there. It's just the same thing. The point is, is to look at this, this, and this, because this is in touch with this, this is in touch with this, and they're all in touch with each other at all times. If you had make it a square, two are out of touch. And I'm telling you, from experience and from knowing and from succeeding, okay, again, this is not about my accomplishments so far. It's not. There are a lot. I'm internationally regarded as, as, a, as a pro athlete, martial arts. Okay, how many rock guitar players, writers of seven books can say that? Not too many. Again, if I would have thought about all of this at 21, whoa, you know, I'm going, whoa. But at any rate, back to the, the training, we go between the three things. But what I want to talk to you about is an offshoot of that, or, or, or maybe a triangle superimposed. Beginner, intermediate, advanced, okay? I think this is really important in martial arts. You know what I'm talking about. As the beginning phase of anything, you should, there should be a great emphasis on technique. And that, and that probably sounds the complete opposite of what you might suspect. But in the beginning, if you practice things correctly, absolutely correctly, with no outside stimulus, no intermediate, you know, uh, stimulus, no advanced stimulus, okay, you can focus on doing something exactly perfectly correct, like your first line of your first poem or the first four stanzas and you rhyme them and you just go easy, perfectly. That's when perfection should be really, really talked about. When you get to an intermediate part, you start thinking about, and let's say we're talking about survival on the streets, okay? When we get to the intermediate part, a beginner is not going to survive in the streets, okay? Not unless you're just naturally gifted, like a couple of buddies we know, you know. Guy out of prison, going to have a good, good chance of surviving on the street. I know a few, okay? I train a few, okay? So they're good street survivors from the get-go. They don't have any technique. They don't need it. No, they have their own technique. You know, some of that you just are innately blessed. But when you get to the intermediate phase, you're still working on this little bit of perfection, but now we start dealing with real life. 
someone's going to fight back. Someone's not going to let you do that little team move you learned in your karate class or something. Doesn't work. There are absolutely thousands of examples of martial artists that got their rear ends handed to them in the streets because somebody didn't know that one move, you know, and just did what they come to them naturally. They were gifted in a natural, maybe predatory way. But at the intermediate phase, you start thinking about that. You start translating and you start doing a little bit of uh, real life scenario. Advanced is chaos. It's what happens in the street. It's no moves and it's multiple attackers. Okay, so it's not this nice little sport thing that you see in the movies, you know, when the one guy's in the middle and all the ninjas come in one at a time and yada, 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 and they, and I'm, I'm totally, you know, uh, downplaying an arch that I love, okay, and respect. Doesn't happen that way. So how do you deal in, in, in the beginning, how does a beginner deal with chaos? Chaos, if, if you come to the jiu-jitsu school that I'm in, that I attend every Thursday, if you came and saw us in there, you'd think we didn't know what the heck we were doing. You go, what is this? Well, we're all really, really advanced, and it's just chaos, and it's real life. Been there, done it, got the t-shirt, I know what it's about. How does, you can see how the beginning, the intermediate phase might relate to the beginning phase, possibly, because you just left there. And so you still have these techniques that you still want to try, but now they're getting, now they're getting tweaked a little bit. You know. Advanced, it's chaos. How does advanced, relate to beginner. Advanced can relate back to intermediate because your foot was just in there. You might have a foot in both camps. Um, uh, this foot's in advanced, this foot's back here in intermediate. I'm um, back and forth. Uh, I, uh, I, I can see both things, sort of. But how does it relate to uh, beginner again? Teaching. Teaching. You take that advanced student and you go, okay, Jane here's new. Show her that move you learned eight years ago. Boom. All the way back to the beginning. All the way back to square one. As a guitarist, I don't practice six, eight hours a day anymore. Who's got the time? I certainly don't have the inclination or the patience. Okay. But I'll take a half hour and I'll go back to the very beginning, to basic stuff, and I will drill, just drill for a half an hour. I got guitars hanging in hard rocks all over this country. Okay. I still practice. Okay. So the point is, is you go back, you go back, and the, and the advanced guy goes back to that beginner girl, and then she's in touch with the intermediate girl, and then it's a cycle that just keeps going. Now, there are offshoots of this, of course. Okay, there are the, what I call my offset threes, and again, it's, it's described clearly in this latest book. I wanted this to be a little bit interactive. I don't want it to go too much longer because we're past the point of uh, what we had originally set up. Uh, I have some closing things I would like to say, but does anybody have a question? Feel free. Yes? How do you channel nostalgia to something positive as, without risking getting stuck in the past? Very good point. Okay, very good question. Very good point. Um, I'm a very nostalgic guy. Very. I can clearly remember, like I mentioned before, all right now on the radio the first time. I remember when Zeppelin's Good Times, Bad Times came on and I was in a band. This is, I'm dating myself big time. I look at my bass player and I go, whoa, we gotta learn the song, you know. Um, what keeps you from staying in the past is doing something now. Write about it now. It, you know, you can go back there and live, but who wants to stay in the past? I mean, you're, you're here now, okay? The band I'm in now is here now and forever. A friend of mine goes here now and hopefully tomorrow because he's a comic, he thinks. But it's here now and forever, which actually represents our names, Holland, Neubauer, and Fath. But it's here and now and forever. And, 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 and that, that's a metaphor for a band. It just happened to work out with our initials. I came up with a title, but you know, Staying in the past is not good on any count, is it, really? I mean, I, I mean, the wonderful things happened, but they happened then. 
we're in time continuum. We're moving on. And, and it's like we're here and now, okay? And hopefully this here and now is a forever occurring thing. Um, I don't know what can keep you in the, from staying in the past, but if you grab it for motivation, whether the motivation is uh, a sad motivation or a happy motivation, I believe in both. It's yin and yang, okay? And they balance each other. You know, you remember the, the book that came out, well, men are from Mars, women are from Venus? Well, really, no fooling. Really, you know? I, I remember seeing that and went, oh, I should have written that book. But anyway, um, we all could have written that book, right? Could everybody have written that book? Did, did anybody read that? You know, I know it's dating everything. Well, you don't need to, okay. You know, <laughs> but at any rate, you know, we covered that here already, you know. Um, but I don't know if I've answered your question, but okay, but you know, Again, nostalgia is an amazing motivator. I love it, but we're now. I mean, I remember my first gr uh, girlfriend. I mentioned a girl named Jane a second ago. That's where that comes in. She's my very first girlfriend. I was about four, five, you know? Yeah, I know, I know. She goes, yeah, I can see it, you know? <laughs> you know? But, I mean, it's great, and I remember, and I wrote a poem called First Kiss. That was her, believe it or not. First kiss, age four or five. Well, when I caught my daughter Sierra at age three kissing Johnny around behind our, our holly tree, I went, all right, I deserve that. I totally deserve that, okay? So <laughs> it's good to go back, but get here, you know. Um, anything, a, a, any, anybody else have a question? Do you find that creating new experiences or new experiences that something that you've never done before or something that you you want to do and never experienced before is, is self-perpetuating. In other words, you do it once and it, you, you keep wanting to do it again. You can if you find the right thing, Jerry, okay? And, and sometimes you need to, you're gonna try something. It may be, um, you, might, you might take, let's for instance, uh, one of the martial arts that I trained in for 14 years was sword, Korean sword. I did sword for 14 years. Now, you don't have to be the greatest shape, athletically, uh, you whatever, to, to do this. Uh, there was a buddy of mine that, that teaches uh, English as a second language at one of the community colleges in the area. And he's in there, and you look at him, he goes, eh, not an athlete. It, it was the greatest thing that Scott could do. And he achieved high level, uh, as I did. Uh, absolutely adored the art of the sword. Hello, did I write a poem about the art of the sword? Of course I did. Okay, but back to your perpetuating thing. You find something, give it a little time, see if it works, and again, you take, read this, take it, put your things into three. You know, when you're training there, a, a training in sword might be, okay, my technique. Okay, I, I, I can get in class two days, two nights a week. You know, so that's, that's, that's two hours, of, you know, commute time is three or four hours out of your week. You do it. Then you think about, okay, well, what's the history of this? And was, I mean, you can find your three points and go. Believe me, they work. They work because they stimulate each other and you improve like crazy. Again, living testament to that. I'm a better writer than I was. My second novel was much greater than my first and my first novel was pretty good. Reviews have been tremendous. Second novel, The Village Squires, Tales of Mayhem and Revenge. It's about a vigilante rock and roll band. Hello, okay? Does it explain itself? Got great reviews, ton of them, ton of them. I'm finishing up my third novel right now as we speak. Okay, so yes, Jerry, it's self-perpetuating. And, and let, me, let me reiterate the health benefits. All of us have stress. All of us have something, you know, that's just, life just is, sometimes is tough. And again, just Google it. Health benefits of undertaking a creative art. It'll blow you away, absolutely blow you away. Anything else before we conclude? Anything else? Well, again, I would like to thank my videographer, Jeff, who's a guitar student of mine, okay, for being here. Thank you for doing this. I'd really like to thank Jerry, Jason, law firm, okay, all of you for being here. Thanks for attending, okay? Like I said, don't worry about this turning up on YouTube or anything, okay? If that's it, there'll be other people to blame. It won't be me, okay? Uh, I needed this, okay? And uh, I hope to see everybody again and continued success. 
and enjoy the book. Uh, if there's not enough records here, I will go down to my Jeep and get a few more copies. And uh, come see my band, July 9th, Jam and Java, record release party, okay? <laughs> it's in Vienna, Virginia. Anyway, thank you for coming, okay? So thank you guys, all right? <laughs>